You are now watching Tales from the Grid. The final season of Power Rangers is a true gem for many reasons. Cosmic Fury marked the almost complete departure from Super Sentai, its main source of inspiration for 30 years. Everybody's entitled to their own opinion, but I do not agree that Cosmic Fury was a gem. It was only 10 episodes. I also don't agree that it was almost a complete departure from Super Sentai, because this season essentially reused Super Sentai suits and footage just like every other season. Little is known about the potential reboot of Power Rangers, but Cosmic Fury could be the last of its kind, with the new direction potentially focusing on an older target audience and severing all ties to the Japanese counterpart. I didn't mind the continuation of the Dino Fury team, but I would prefer if Power Rangers took a more mature route. I'd like the tone to be more like Time Force, Lightspeed Rescue, or SPD. I don't think having ties with their Japanese origin was a problem because other Japanese toku franchises have been able to have a more serious tone while sticking to their Japanese roots. While the 30th installment was received with mixed feelings by the Power Rangers fans, it is undeniable that Cosmic Fury, despite its production complexities, delivered an epic and satisfying finale. At first, this statement seems contradictory, but upon a second reading, it seems to acknowledge that Cosmic Fury wasn't the best. The franchise's audience interest was limited to a couple of years due to the complete refresh of cast and theme for each Sentai-inspired season. Unlike other franchises such as Marvel and Star Wars, Power Rangers suffered from the lack of continuity of character. In order to retain audiences for longer, Simon Bennett suggested to Hasbro, the Dino Fury cast were fantastic and worked really well together and with production. Why don't we keep them going into the next season? I do agree that the yearly rotation of teams does limit the impact and recognition of that team to casual fans. Having the same team stay on for more than one season is a good idea because the increased longevity of a team will help build brand recognition and help more casual fans build a connection with the team. Previously and historically, I think the production of the TV show had been funded very much by advanced sales of the toys that were connected with the show. And Cosmic Fury happened at a time where Hasbro were, um, and this is all out there in the public domain, were, were thinking hard about where their priorities lay for the future. And they were deciding to move um, very much towards focusing on their billion dollar brands and that um, they wouldn't spend as much time or attention on, on lesser brands that didn't generate as much revenue. It was not that um, Power Rangers wasn't profitable, it was that it wasn't nearly as successful, widely recognized or lucrative as something like Transformers or uh, My Little Pony, which were, were other brands that they owned. I've heard that shows like Power Rangers, along with Transformers and G.I. Joe, are essentially 20 minute commercials for toys and merch because that's where the money is made. And then um, at, I think at the beginning of 2022, um, we found out that yes, there would be a Cosmic Fury, but it would only be 10 episodes and it would be a Netflix original. Netflix were picking up the, the bill for it. So we were lucky, we, we got a reprieve, but we were pretty certain it, there wouldn't be any more beyond that, which is why um, the end is called the end, the final episode. And, and and why we actually um, wanted to wrap everything up. In 2022, Hasbro introduced Blueprint 2.0, which is their plan to focus their time, attention, and money on their more profitable brands. It makes sense that Netflix would be the one to pay for Cosmic Fury because they had already paid for the 30th anniversary as well. If a parent company is not willing to pay for a full or even a half season for their property's own show, then it's probably a wrap for the show. Should Cosmic Fury adapt Uchu Sentai Kyurenga footage, Bennett confessed it was not feasible to establish 12 Rangers a number that did not match with the Dino Fury team with only 10 episodes. Having 12 Rangers would have been nice, but due to the 10 episode limitation, the only way it could work is if there was a final battle where six of the Rangers family and friends were given Ranger powers. In addition, there was the desire for Hasbro to move towards original costumes and props to ease toy production, which is the business model of Power Rangers. Simon Bennett explained that the process of evolution of those costumes was very much one of simplification for toy manufacturing. It was important to Hasbro to keep the dinosaur theme going, but with a space theme added on. One thing that Hasbro was very adamant on was making the branding stronger in these new designs, 
hence the heavy inclusion of the lightning bolt logo. And then, of course, the great irony was the Ranger toys were never actually produced, which is sad. Due to the Power Rangers brand being deemed not profitable by Hasbro, they influenced some of the decisions regarding the production of the show. The backlash over the suit's redesign was because Hasbro wanted to have a simpler design to make figures out of. The Lightning Bolt logo being slapped onto everything was because Hasbro wanted stronger brand recognition. Then in the end, they did all that for nothing because no figures ever came out. Although the toy line never saw the light of day, one particular design was actually produced, the new Morpher. Only four Cosmic Fury toys were produced, five if you count the Halloween costumes. Based on how heavy-handed Hasbro was with production, you would have thought we'd get more than four items and Halloween costumes. At least the items produced included the Morpher and Megazord. Cosmic Fury took it one step further, raising the stakes through sacrifice while bringing more inclusivity to the series. One of the best parts of Cosmic Fury is Amelia Jones's promotion to Red Ranger, the team's new leader. There's no problem with being inclusive, it's just that the way it's commonly implemented is what spurs such vitriol from fans. One of the things that turned people off about inclusivity is the way it's forced into the story and put on a pedestal regardless of how it affects the final product. Part of the promotion for Cosmic Fury was Amelia being a female Red Ranger. Even this article is saying that her be Coming Red was one of the best parts of the season. In the show, the characters didn't mention anything about her being female, which is how it should be, because gender doesn't determine who gets to be the Red Ranger. The near obsession about Amelia being a female Red Ranger is reminiscent of the obsession with Izzy being a lesbian Ranger. There are fans that are more focused on these characters' gender and orientation rather than their individual identities. Putting Amelia and Izzy on a pedestal because they're a female Red or a lesbian is low-key offensive because they're more than just their gender and orientation. Throughout Dino Fury, on more than one occasion, Amelia showed her ability to step up and guide the Rangers during difficult times. Amelia is the heart and soul of the team, and I was okay with her being promoted to Red. I would have preferred that the marketing of Amelia's promotion was due to her stepping up and taking charge when things got rough. Making her promotion about being a woman reduces her as an individual. The Morphin Grid chose her to wear the iconic Red. The Morphin Grid didn't choose Amelia to be Red. Either Hasbro, Simon, or the writers did. The rationale behind moving Amelia from pink to red. It was really about wanting a bit more representation within Power Rangers. A lot of women and girls enjoy the show as well as boys and men, so why should there not be more gender equality within the team? We wanted to say that girls can be leaders too. One sentence later confirms that the Morphin Grid didn't choose Amelia. It was the so-called need for more representation because someone in charge thinks girls can't see themselves as leaders unless they see a girl as Red Ranger. The funny thing is that there has been other female Red Rangers and other female Rangers who were in leadership positions within the team. So this push for a female Red Ranger for representation purposes comes off as virtue signaling by production, an attempt to pander to the minority female audience to increase views and sales or both. It's belittling to think that girls can't see themselves as leaders unless they see a woman in the Red Ranger suit. Billy has been a leader and mentor for several Ranger teams, and he's a Blue Ranger, so you don't necessarily have to be the Red Ranger to be a leader. We thought, who better than him to join the Morphin Masters and become the most powerful Power Ranger in history? Um, this is a load of bull because, as we've seen, the Morphin Masters don't do anything and have a vow not to intervene. Master Green had to help in secret and was punished for helping. The Morphin Masters were easily captured in battle. The Morphin Masters reside in the Morphin Grid and mostly stay hands-off with conflicts, so Zato can only watch his friends continue to live their lives, but that's the extent of his new role. He's not the most powerful ranger. I believe this was a convoluted way to replace Zato with Amelia while trying to minimize potential backlash from the audience. Javi Garcia's act of courage releasing the Cosmic Fury Zords with the Morphin Masters staff in the show's season premiere is a very powerful moment for the Black Ranger. I agree that Javi taking the staff while knowing the risks was courageous. Simon Bennett confessed that including a disabled ranger was quite complex. We wanted to tell the story of someone who was able to move forward into their post-disability life in a positive way. I don't think we were able to tell that story with the depth that we wanted to. The script 
groups had to be run by disability consultants, and there was a very strong mandate that we weren't allowed to show this in a negative light. We couldn't show pain. We couldn't show blood. We couldn't show despair, particularly for a musician who's lost their ability to play their instrument. We had to very quickly move from shock to the rebuilding phase, and a big part of what would naturally come in between, we leapfrogged over. Bennett added that although he still feels like they didn't do the story justice entirely, the representation factor still made this a hugely positive part of the show. So I guess because Harvey lost his arm, he's no longer Harvey, he's now the disabled ranger. Another example of taking away someone's identity and reducing them to the thing that makes them different. Simon even admits that they couldn't tell the story in the way they wanted to because they had to abide by consultants and very strong mandates that dictate what can and cannot be shown. Simon also saying the representation factor was a hugely positive part of the show. After saying how trying to be inclusive was restrictive, caged his creativity, and held back the story is an aspect of inclusivity that people don't like. This implementation of inclusivity makes it seem like you'll do as you're told and you'll like it. The story could have been that Javi losing his arm sent him into despair to the point where he couldn't muster up the strength to join the other rangers to fight until they get captured, and then that could have been his moment to make a comeback despite his loss. Javi got a fix for his disability the next episode, so it's like he's not really disabled anymore, but now the show can claim they had the first disabled ranger, which to me looks like pandering to the minority disabled audience despite Javi being disabled for a few minutes. Since Dino Fury, the love story between Izzy and Fern has been a highlight of the show delving into the complicated lifestyle of a superhero always having to sacrifice personal life for the greater good. The Izzy Fern relationship was not a highlight of the show as there were multiple complex relationships on the show. At least four of the Rangers were balancing their personal lives while also being a Ranger. Simon Bennett explained that the bigger arc for their relationship, which had to be shortened due to the episode count cut in half, was much more complicated with the overprotectiveness causing their breakup. I did feel like Izzy was doing the most by being overprotective over Fern. She was being somewhat condescending and talking down to Fern as if she were a child. I can see why Fern would break up with her. The disrespect is crazy. I still am very happy that Fern became the Orange Ranger and that Solon was her dinosaur. I really liked the way that happened. I liked that Fern became a Ranger and how she became one. The way she became a Ranger seemed like the natural progression of her character always helping, so it makes sense why she was chosen to become a Ranger. This is the type of storytelling that needs to be utilized in other parts of the series. A welcome surprise was the inclusion of Billy Cranston, the one and only mighty Morphin Blue Ranger in Cosmic Fury. His role wasn't just a simple fan service cameo, but a strong supporting role for the team very much like in Power Rangers Zeo. We'd seen in his interviews online that he had been treated poorly by all accounts when he was on the show previously, and we thought, wouldn't it be fantastic to bring him back and have him treated really well so that the franchise could move on from that bad blood? We could honor and respect the contribution that he had made to Power Rangers over all those years. I enjoyed the inclusion of Billy because he's an OG and I do see him as a mentor to the Cosmic Fury team. The decision to bring him back as an act of gratitude for his contribution to the show was a nice thing to do and they did it well. Zordon's essence was still out there somewhere. A lot of fans had a lot to say about the Zordon part. I'm 50-50 about it. Some say Zordon still being alive waters down his sacrifice which I can see why they feel like that. Lord Zed returned in full force in Cosmic Fury. If it had just been Squillia and Bajillia as the baddies in Cosmic Fury, they wouldn't have been nearly as dangerous or significant as having Lord Zed. If it was truly going to be the last series, what better villain to have than Lord Zed? I don't mind having Lord Zed be the villain for Cosmic Fury. Some fans may think having Lord Zed as the villain is abusing nostalgia instead of creating a new powerful character, but I don't feel that way. When he became Master Zed, I was surprised and very impressed. I think it worked well for the story. It also created extra pressure on Amelia because her boyfriend has been turned evil at the same time as she's having to step up to be a team leader. I'll say Amelia's leadership was questionable because at certain points she was putting Ollie's life over the fate of the whole world, which is low-key selfish. Simon Bennett revealed that he had future plans for Power Rangers, which sadly never came to fruition. I came up with a pitch for a possible season 31, which never went anywhere. It was a fully-fledged 
finished kind of Bible document, and within it were types of rangers that I would like to see in the future. I would have liked to have seen a plus-size Power Ranger. I would have liked to have seen a Power Ranger in a wheelchair that could transform into some kind of very cool fighting tool when that Ranger morphed. I would have liked to have seen a non-binary Power Ranger. That was actually something that we were kind of setting up. It was going to be J.J. Oliver, Tommy Oliver's teenage child who was established in canon in Power Rangers Super Ninja Steel Episode 10 Dimensions in Danger. We saw potentially Min from Once and Always and the non-binary character putting together a team of misfits. Simon's ambitions for Season 31 are him losing the plot. The focus of Season 31 should be like the focus of every other season, which is to write a good story. Him wanting to include a plus-size wheelchair and non-binary rangers is once again making these characters' identities about their differences instead of focusing on them as individual people who happen to have such differences. This idea reeks of tokenism and will affect story writing because now you have to write the characters in a manner that has to be approved by consultants which can dictate where the story can and cannot go. If writing Javi's story was a hassle without a proper payoff, then why subject yourself to that treatment three more times? I wouldn't mind seeing a second generation team of Mighty Morphin with men as the leader, but this team of misfits idea is tokenism and pandering in disguise. He added that he would have liked to see the show continue to grow in terms of linked stories with Ranger teams that exist through multiple seasons to help build and maintain audiences' engagement. You get brand people within a corporation that can get cold feet if something deviates too far from what they perceive as being the rules of the show. It's hard to be original within a long-running franchise within a corporate structure. I like I like the idea of having mashups of teams like in Once a Ranger, but instead for an entire season. Now this is some creative storytelling and an opportunity to blend generational audiences. I get why corporate doesn't like to deviate from whatever storyline that works because a proven formula is safe and predictable. But what happens is down the line, the story can become stale and that's when you need to mix things up while still staying relatively in line with the original story. Power Rangers franchise as we know it ended in a powerful way with Cosmic Fury. I don't know why why Cosmic Fury is being gassed as this big send-off. I liked the last episode, but there was still filler even in this 10-episode half-season. I like that we got a season 30 even though it was 10 episodes, and I like that this season attempted to explore new ideas. It sucks that we were only able to squeeze out 10 episodes in the last season, and corporate's behind-the-scenes handling of this show really was abysmal. Hasbro put minimal effort into the show and got little to no return on investment. This shouldn't have been how the series ended if this is truly the end. At least we still have the memory. Thank you for watching another episode of Tales from the Grid, and until next time, have a good one. <laughs>